Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this session. It's a privilege and an honor to have these friends and colleagues here with me today. Uh, let me share a little bit about the structure of today's session. Uh, I am going to, to introduce you to my colleague uh, Valeria, then my colleague Melissa, and then finally our uh, guest speaker, Professor Virginia Bodolica. Right. So um, I want to invite Valeria, the Vice President of Emerald for Latin America and the Caribbean, to share a few words so we can start this webinar. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you, André. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to, to welcome Professor Virginia, Melissa, and, and André, and thank you all for organizing this session. Uh, it's really interesting to have like a representation pretty much from everywhere. We are from we are in Brazil. Uh, me and myself, André, and Melissa is in Boston, and Professor Virginia is in the uh, she was saying close to Dubai. I think it's easier to, to refer. So it's really interesting to see this global presence. Uh, we had the pleasure uh, to learn from Professor Virginia last year. Uh, the session was excellent and really pleased to have you back here to show us and share your knowledge. Uh, also, Melissa will be able so to, to do her presentation uh, and share her uh, expertise as a publishing for the cases. So um, I'd like to say thank you again and just wish everybody an um, excellent meeting. And I, we're all going to be here uh, learning all this session, about this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valeria. I am passing the, the screen sharing to Melissa and want to invite my colleague Melissa Close, our cases publisher to share her presentation and we will get some context about the, the program, the cases program, before we pass it on to Professor Virginia. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Um, can everyone see my slides? I think I did it correctly. Yep. Perfect. Um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here today speaking with you all. Um, and for my portion of the presentation, I'm going to talk about talking, publishing with our Emerging Markets Case Studies collection, um, and also highlight some useful resources that Emerald has available to help you write your case study. So just to kick off, um, to tell you a bit more about myself, um, I am the Cases Commissioning Lead at Emerald Publishing. Um, so I look after our various cases collections um, and I'm based in Boston in the United States. Um, and I did want to share my email address um, just in case you want to reach out after the presentation. I'm more than happy to share these slides um, and answer any questions or comments that might occur to you afterwards. But that's all about me. Let's talk about uh, the Emerging Markets Case Studies Collection. Uh, so EMCS, as we typically uh, call it, publishes discussion-based teaching case studies that offer students the opportunity to explore real-world challenges in the classroom environment. Uh, and when compared to other case study collections, um, EMCS specializes specifically in case research um, from and about emerging markets and developing economies. Um, and these are regions that we see typically traditionally underrepresented in teaching case collections, but which certainly offer unique and important insights that offer valuable experiences to students. So for us, we are all about you know, providing these cases that allow students to test their decision-making skills before taking their knowledge into the workplace. Um, and there are a couple things that authors who publish with us um, should know about the collection. Um, so in terms of our scope, we publish cases from all business and management disciplines. Um, we are a Scopus indexed collection, um, which I do think really speaks to the quality of our authors um, and our editorial team and being able to uphold those rigorous expectations of Scopus. Um, all of the cases we publish do include teaching notes um, to help faculty lead that case in their classroom. Um, we are also open to submissions year round with no submission fee. Um, 
we are fully double blind peer reviewed. So when you submit with us, you will receive feedback on your case um, and potentially go through a couple rounds of revision to help you improve it. Um, and we do offer payment upon publication to our authors. Um, and if you are interested in viewing the collection to see what we've published recently, um, this link on the slide will take you to our website um, where you can search by subject or time published um, or, or specific um, discipline you're looking for. So on this slide, I just wanted to briefly highlight uh, the team that makes it all happen at EMCS. Uh, we couldn't have this collection without our editor-in-chief, Dr. Michael Goldman, um, who is based at the University of San Francisco, um, and also our wonderful team of associate editors who work very closely with Michael to manage submissions, um, including Virginia, who's going to be speaking with us very shortly. Uh, so when you submit to EMCS and your publication goes through the review process, it's more than likely that one of these individuals is going to be facilitating that review um, and sharing their feedback through email. So just a very warm thank you, thank you to all of these people who put in so much effort um, to the collection. Um, in terms of you know, what you can actually expect when submitting with EMCS, I did think it was helpful to just give you a brief crash course in our process. Um, we have included a link to our online submission management platform, Scholar ScholarOne, um, which is where you would be able to register an account um, and start a new submission as an author and send that in. Um, at that point, once you do submit your manuscript, it's going to move into some basic publisher checks. Um, this is just where we make sure that you have included all the basic elements of the case. You know, you have permission, you have the teaching note, um, everything that we really mention in our author guidelines um, as a requirement for publishing with EMCS. If we look through your case and say everything's in order, we're good to go, um, we're gonna pass that on to the editorial team for an initial evaluation. Um, and at this point, they'd be looking at things like the scope to see if this is, you know, in line with EMCS's goals. Um, and if they think this is worth taking forward, they're going to then pass it on to the review process itself. Um, and this is where, you know, one of the associate editors might step in to manage your submission or the editor himself. Um, so they will send out the case to independent reviewers to provide some feedback. Uh, we typically provide our reviewers with 30 days to read through your case and then make their notes and feed those back to the associate editor. Um, and at that point, the editor is then going to take that feedback that they've been provided with and make an, a decision. Um, and there are three different things that could happen at this stage. Um, you could receive a revise decision, which is fairly common for first time submissions. Um, it's basically a really encouraging thing actually to have the opportunity to incorporate those notes that you've received to improve your case. Because um, I think a revised decision is a really good indication that they've seen something of merit in your work um, and developmentally will be good to you know, publish the best case you possibly can. Um, so if you do receive a revise, we hope that you will come back um, and resubmit that and you'll go through another round of review um, before the editor makes another decision. The other possibilities at the editor decision stage are reject um, or accept. Um, if you are accepted, um, you would then go on to the production team where they'll send proofs to you um, that you can approve before it's finally put up on the website and published. Um, the amount of time that it can take to publish with EMCS does vary just depending on the amount of revision that your case is asked to go through, um, but we do try to provide a first decision to authors within 60 days, so you will know fairly quickly um, what that initial decision is. Um, and when you do, you know, come to EMCS if you're interested in submitting, I did want to flag some upcoming opportunities that prevent, you know, kind of special occasions for different um, special issues. And we also run a number of competitions throughout the year. Um, so first off, just the special issues we have on hot topics in emerging markets. Um, we have a number with upcoming deadlines scattered throughout the year. So still plenty of time to prepare a submission um, and get something in to be included in this kind of curated collection. Uh, so we have one on informal business practices, uh, another on construction, real estate, infrastructure, and project management in emerging markets. And then lastly, innovative startups in emerging markets. 
we do continually add new special e issues throughout the year um, and we are also open to proposals for new special issues if that's something you're interested in potentially leading as a guest editor um, if you are please do reach out to me and i'd love to have that conversation with you um, but otherwise i would encourage you to see all of our current calls for cases on the website through this link um, and the same can be said for the competitions as well um, I don't believe there are any um, with really pressing deadlines at the moment, um, but you can see, just keep an eye on it coming forward because they do present really good opportunities to, you know, get recognition um, and be awarded to the, the winner of the competition. Um, and quickly, I just wanted to run through those resources for writing that I mentioned. Um, and we'll hop right into it so I don't take up too much of uh, Virginia speaking time. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to mention is the Cases Learning Hub. Uh, so the Cases Hub is a completely free online resource um, that's been developed in concert with case experts to help you write your case. Um, so it's completely free to register an account, um, and this link will take you to the website um, where you will find a number of different modules that will take you through the entire experience from end to end. So if you've never written a case before, this is going to give you all the tips and tricks you need um, to create you know, a compact or a concise, nuanced quality teaching case. Um, and this screenshot that I've included on the screen um, is our writing module. Um, so this is a course where you'll be able to track your progress towards completing your case. Um, and it has different mini sections within it on identifying that need, you know, deciding what it is you're going to write about, uh, what you want your students to take away from that case, you know, setting learning objectives and whatnot, um, getting ready to write, writing the case study itself and evaluating your case study. Um, so really well-rounded, you can go at your own pace and having this to help you know, keep you on track and accountable, I found to be really helpful. Um, and as in terms of what you'll actually see when you do dive into this course, um, we have a number of videos from our editors, um, such as this one that I've also added the picture of where Michael's speaking about good discussion questions. Um, we also feature a number of videos from the editor of our case journal, um, Rebecca Morris, we have infographics that you can interact with. Um, it's designed to be very engaging to help you improve your understanding of the case method, um, maybe have some fun while doing it, and at the end of the day, get you published, um, which is our main goal. We also have a couple of other modules in addition to the writing track um, on the Cases Hub, which I wanted to flag. Um, these are teaching with a case study, learning with case studies, and useful resources. So the teaching module um, is very helpful if you are um, not as experienced with using this method in your classroom. This will help you gain confidence um, in picking up new cases, facilitating that discussion, um, and is also very much go at your own pace with your own goals. The learning with case studies is quite fun because this is something you can actually assign to students um, aligned with any case that you are conducting in class um, and ask them to do it as part of their homework in order to make sure that they're thoroughly preparing um, and doing the necessary you know, analytical prep work um, in order to have a good discussion once you're all together. So this learning module will ask them to read through the case and then note down all of the important details, um, such as who is the protagonist or what the dilemma is. Um, and they'll have a question and answer space to start thinking about potential recommendations they could make in response to that dilemma. Um, and then at the end of the module, they have the option to export all of the notes they've taken as a PDF that they can then bring to the classroom discussion to make sure that, you know, you're having a really thorough um, analytical and quality um, classroom time. And then finally, those useful resources um, are going to include things like webinars we've done in the past. Um, we also have some guides on permissions and um, rights, which is always really helpful to have as you're going about writing your case, um, and a number of guides to you know, writing your case study itself and the teaching note. So I hope you do take advantage of this cases hub as i mentioned it's completely free and go at your own pace uh, some other resources we have available are 
that guide to writing teaching cases and a guide to writing a teaching note. Um, both of these are linked actually in EMCS's author guidelines. Um, so I would encourage you to read through them in full um, and then you can download them and start working offline on your case. And then finally, the last resource I wanted to flag was the Compact Guide to Compact Case Cases, um, which was authored by one of our other editors, Rebecca Morris. Um, and this includes, you know, annotated cases, examples, um, helpful checklists and roadmaps, um, pretty much anything you could possibly need to write a compact case, um, which is something that our collections do accept um, as a, a, a type of case. Um, if you're unfamiliar, a compact case is really just super concise. Um, it's meant to be within about a thousand words, so you could theoretically give it to your students in class. They could read it in about 10 minutes and you could have a discussion right there and there, right then and there. Um, so it's got some growing interest um, and also, you know, a really good tool for the classroom. Um, and if you're interested in this compact guide, um, it is available on our bookstore. We actually published it um, just a couple of weeks ago. And that was the last resource that I wanted to flag. Um, I hope that was useful. I'm now going to pass it over to Virginia for her portion of the presentation. Um, I'll try to stop sharing my screen somehow. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. If you want, I can make her a uh, presenter. And okay. also, in, in the meantime, I will introduce Professor Virginia to our audience. I, I think Regina has the permission to, to share now. So um, Professor Regina Bodolica is the Said T. Corey Chair of Leadership Studies and a Professor of Management in the School of Business Administration at the American University of Sharia. I hope I pronounced this correctly in the UIA. And she's a passionate academic, as most of us know, an advocate of cross-disciplinary research and practice, and an award-winning case studies writer. As you can imagine, she has a very, very long uh, curriculum. I, I won't have the time to read all the lines I have here, but I, I'm sure we will have a great session today. Thank you, Professor Regina. It's a pleasure to have you here, and the session is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I adore to work with very dynamic team from Emerald. So thank you, Andre. It's our second interaction. It was very successful, the first one. And I am really happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, Valeria, very nice to interact with you, to see you, uh, even if virtually, but hopefully one day it's going to be face to face. And Melissa, too, the very young, young, uh, but very dedicated to the case collection from uh, uh, the Emerald publishing team. I'm very happy to see you virtually. I hope all the attendees from this webinar will benefit from this hopefully very, very constructive session and a session that will encourage you to start writing case studies. If you use so far cases of others, I would like really through this webinar to encourage you to start doing your own because the pleasure of developing your own case from scratch and designing it for your own classes, for the benefit of your students, knowing the style that you're gonna use in the classroom and really writing uh, about the topics that are close to your heart and also very relevant for today's world and students in your classroom is really an amazing thing. And of course, you can then, thanks to the venue that we have in Emerald with different uh, case collections, but particularly Emerald Emerging Market Case Collection, uh, we have this venue for publication where you can spread your case and share your case with the entire world. So I'm really happy here to share a little bit of my knowledge, my experience, and to shed light on the process of writing um, case studies and also um, successfully publishing the case study. Thank you to Melissa, who uh, reviewed a little bit the process, uh, how the publication happens, and also um, uh, the resources. We have a lot of resources online which are helpful uh, in uh, conceptualizing, initiating, uh, gathering data, writing the case, uh, revising the case, and all those 
very difficult, but at the same time, very motivating processes that end up in something very substantially beautiful and amazing that you can use in your own classroom and then share with other uh, instructors across the world. So I am, as Andrea said, uh, I am based in uh, Valeria too. I'm based at the American University of Sharjah. I do chair a leadership uh, center where I do research and I take time to really emphasize this uh, because I guess out of almost 100 or so attendees that we have, many of them, I imagine, are professors, um, assistant associates, full professors, um, people who start their academic careers, and many can be skeptical thinking about, well, maybe she, meaning Virginia, is based in a teaching university, so where writing case studies uh, is something that is really appreciated and valued and recognized and is a key uh, indicator of the quality of the teacher who is also uh, got, uh, getting promoted based on the publication of teaching case studies. Well, uh, as I said, I am uh, chairing a center of uh, leadership studies, so which is purely a research driven center, right, where you have to write academic articles and publication and things like that. And at the same time, I am uh, an associate editor of a teaching case study collection, so where I do myself publish a lot of teaching case studies. So I'm going to show you the perspective of a researcher, of a teacher, of an academic, of an author, of an instructor, uh, and I'm going to share and hopefully convince you about all the benefits that writing your own case study, using your own case study in the classroom, and sharing your case study with uh, the other instructors, researchers, scholars across the world is extremely beneficial. Uh, so uh, I'll start with something um, which is more skeptical, and this is a kind of preamble to case writing and how this case writing can help me in my academic career, meaning you, anybody who is sitting there, who is listening, who joined us for this webinar, uh, whoever who has this skeptical perspective about is that really useful for me? So several questions that you can ask yourself, and I'm sure you are about to ask yourself. Why writing cases at all, right? Pedagogical or teaching, as we refer to that. Why? Why to do that? What's in it for me? How would it really benefit my career, me personally, if I'm an academic, and if I'm working in a given university? Um, isn't it too demanding? So maybe uh, the novice writers of case studies wouldn't know, but I think Melissa mentioned uh, rapidly that there are two documents, and I'm going to emphasize that in uh, today's webinar, that there are two complete documents, and particularly the second one, which is longer, significantly longer than the first one, that you have to include with your submission uh, of the case study that you would like to publish. And only one of those two documents is going to be published, while the second one is as a resource uh, for other teachers who would like to use your case in their own classes. So it's only one that is published yet. Without the second document, your case would not be even accepted for peer review. So, right, there is a double effort as if you are writing two uh, documents or two articles. Well, so we can be skeptical, isn't it a double effort that is required? Maybe it's uh, better to focus on research papers, right, and to avoid uh, focusing on, on uh, writing pedagogical teaching case studies. Uh, would I get some credit for that, right, if I'm working in, in my academic institution? So um, would that be a credit when I'm evaluated in my annual evaluation? Would I get credit because I'm a good teacher, because I've developed some teaching material? Or I would get some research credit, so recognition of the fact that it is a challenging process of publication. So as for research papers, to publish a teaching case study, you go through the same very rigorous process of peer review with different people and stakeholders being involved. So it's not something that is straightforward and it's very challenging and demanding, right? Um, there is another question where you say, when exactly during my career can I afford or can I give myself the luxury of starting writing those um, teaching case studies, right? Is it better to start my career with that? in the middle, at the end, when it is more appropriate to do that. 
And then um, would it make my promotion case stronger? So if we are starting the academic career and we'd like to get promoted from maybe we're instructors, then we go to assistant associate and then full professor levels and so on. So would it really benefit to my portfolio when I submit my candidacy for promotion? So I'm gonna answer all these uh, questions uh, through my own, uh, and basically the other la last question that I didn't mention, what about the case journals, right, where we are submitting our, our case, uh, are those case journal and indexed, right? So are they um, recognized for their quality? Is that a solid journal that is then recognized as a solid outlet where I can uh, publish my case study, right? And I think Melissa also proudly, and we are all proud uh, as a team who are associate and, uh, and the editor-in-chief, um, Dr. Michael Goldman, and asked about six to seven associate editors are very proud to say that the collection um, is a solid peer-reviewed uh, collection and a journal which is um, indexed in Scopus, which most universities across the world and educational institution um, take in consideration as part of promotion portfolios of the faculty uh, who publish in those Scopus index journals. So that is already a very big, big, big plus and an encouragement and motivation for people to really pursue publications in this a journal. So I'm going to answer those questions from my perspective, but remember, it's a perspective of an author, of an academic, of a researcher, of a scholar, of a teacher, and of a person who uses somebody else's cases. So it's a really comprehensive perspective, plus an associate editor in several journals which publish um, um, teaching case studies, right? So it's a, it's a very balanced perspective that I'm going to give you here, not biased, but really balanced, where I'll show my own experience and at the same time, I'll share some of the secrets of the successful case writing and publication. So one of the things to convince you more and more why writing cases, you can see here and I presented on the screen such a variety of reasons why writing cases is fundamental and it's really good. Without any discussion, it improves your pedagogy. Um, as uh, Melissa, even Andre, and also rapidly we were discussing at the beginning about the emerging market emphasis of the collection that we have at Emerald, uh, and we see that there are so many situations that develop in emerging markets and we don't have enough cases to showcase the situations that occur in emerging markets. So this collection focuses exactly on situations and management dilemmas and decisions of different protagonists that occur in emerging markets. So um, we don't have enough cases to showcase the examples of uh, maybe failures or situation of successes in those companies. So by developing our own cases, we can improve our pedagogy in the classroom. It allows us also to explore the world. It's not necessarily that because I'm based in UAE, in United Arab Emirates, I'm gonna write cases only about UAE. I can associate with some scholars from other emerging markets and then maybe write a comparative case studies to see situations of uh, companies which started from UAE or from the Gulf region and then try to went to to go to North Africa or maybe to Latin America in order to uh, create a subsidiary and then have specific cultural dilemmas, right? So by collaborating with somebody from another merging market, I really explore the world and I get to know so many things and I get to share those perspectives with my class. So the fact that I am uh, doing this, I can also connect and create a linkage between the academia, the university, and the industry. Our students are craving to have guest speakers, to have real things in the classroom. They do not really like for us to come and talk about theory and theory and theory. They believe the theory is really detached from practice if we do not come with the real situation uh, that occur in real identifiable companies that they can identify with and then can embrace uh, um, the, the situation and take uh, the, the, the protagonist's role and then imagine that they are the protagonists of these situations and then they are making decisions in the place of those protagonists uh, in those identifiable organizations. Um, of course, the capacity to publish, so it's, uh, it's speaking already to your 
skillful capacity to deliver that information in a very attractive manner to students, but also to others who evaluated your case, who reviewed your case. It means that you are really successful writer. It's a skill that not everybody possesses. So it speaks loudly about your capacity that you can uh, publish a case and then share and disseminate with so many people spread ar around the world. Um, of course, uh, writing uh, about topics which are attractive, which are topical, which are uh, happening just, just right now, and which are attracting interest uh, of students in the classroom. That's another um, uh, point of differentiation that allows you to then start really writing case studies. Of course, it allows you also through writing case studies about real uh, companies, you develop your capacity to understand the context of new industries, of new companies, and then develop even some um, targeted or customized executive education programs where you can develop the cases for those clients, right? And then benefit even more and bring that knowledge back in the classroom. And of course, the very important thing that we don't forget, we are all academics, majority of people who are there, instructors in, in the university, or who would like to start their career there, and we have this imperative of publish or perish. So the fact that we are publishing, it's already reinforcing our academic career. Now, another relevant question, and again, from my perspective as an author, and at the same time, a person who did through many uh, passed through many stages of development of case writing. I started from somewhere learning uh, through interaction, taking different webinars, accessing different resources that we have online. It was a trial and error. I've seen myself developing and growing over the years, uh, which culminated in, in many awards for case writing uh, and with many, uh, I would say, innovative approaches to case writing that I will even mention in a couple of seconds during this webinar. So the key question is when exactly in your, if you are thinking about starting or continue your academic career. When exactly is the most appropriate to start writing your own case studies? Not using others, but writing them and then publishing them and then having this luxury of using your own case study and allowing other scholars around the world or teachers around the world to use your case. In my case, I would tell you that my first ever publication, my academic career was before I graduated, even though uh, now it is the reality of many um, of many students who are PhD students to graduate from the program with three articles. At my time, it was a long time ago, I didn't have that choice. It was a dissertation that I had to write. So it's a really, really a long time ago. But I was really interested in um, developing and writing and developing my writing skills through um, the case studies. And my professor, one of the professors uh, whom I had during my PhD uh, times, actually hired me and said, you know what, as a research assistant, and he said, you know what, I need a case study uh, for my classes at the master level to emphasize and uh, to showcase the situation of a multinational corporation which um, uh, experiences very challenging situation in, in operating in the international market. So there are cultural issues, clashes, dilemmas. So I, I would need that. And I need, of course, a real case uh, based on real situations. So it was my first, first exposure to the case writing. It was my first publication. And it started even before I graduated my P from the PhD program. And this continued throughout my, my career with the last case that I published in 2021. And hopefully it will continue into this year and uh, many years to come. Um, just to show you, publishing in many different um, journals, uh, um, which you have a lot of opportunities because there are several collections where you can submit that. But I also published uh, books uh, with case studies. And one of these books, for instance, um, is focused on uh, all the topic of managing organizations in United Arab Emirates. And I uh, combined all the cases that I wrote on particularly uh, United Arab Emirates uh, companies. And then I divided uh, the different chapters of the book based on the topics that are being covered in those case studies. So you see, you have many possibilities and opportunities to publish than the cases that you develop. Um, how did I personally and how I think you would benefit from writing case studies? 
uh, I think we don't have to reiterate the importance of teaching, right? Uh, more and more in the pandemic taught us and, and really showed us how more interactive, how more demanding, but at the same time, how more challenging it becomes to be an impactful teacher. Uh, with us being confined to our personal uh, spaces and uh, being always divided uh, by that, that screen, not being able to interact uh, with each other face to face, we started to, to think what are different tools that we can use in order to make our classroom more interactive. And cases, I would say, in my experience of teaching during COVID, uh, became really a lifesavers uh, where I could bring a little bit of life uh, enjoyment in, into students' eyes when they could really have still those virtual teams to discuss the challenges that uh, the different corporations had through the assignments of different uh, teaching cases. So, of course, teaching becomes more dynamic, more vibrant, more interactive, and it allows students to really see the reality of the world and the challenges and the dilemmas that uh, organizations face. Of course, you as a, as a writer of the case study, it allows you to tap into so many different skills because writing a teaching case study is not the same like writing a research paper. It's really you tap into different types of skills. It's more your narrative style of writing. It's your capacity to write like a story which will hook the reader, will guide the reader through a story and keep the person, whoever is that reader, definitely mostly the student, to, to go through the beginning till the end of the case. So you go into a variety of skills of your artistry of language and the way how you develop that, while at the same time, keeping in mind that this is a pedagogical case study that you don't have to give away the answers into, in, in that case study. So you have to preserve a, 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 a kind of um, enigmatic uh, a connotation to your case study so that uh, the reader is um, amazed by what is going on, but then you submit to the um, to the student to analyze the case and to come with some possible solutions to those dilemmas. So it's artistic way to write that in a way that is not so obvious, while at the same time very intriguing and for the student to uh, get engaged into the case. In my case, executive education, I did develop many case studies for executive clients, right? There were a company who said, yes, we would like to get uh, some programs, customized programs for us, for our executives, but we would like case studies to be written on our companies and then our executives, when they come to universe to take uh, seminars with you, uh, we would like you to give them the case of our organization so that they can really practically analyze and propose things based on the case of our organization. Uh, my career, I got in sabbatical and, uh, and other opportunities, for instance, being offered some of uh, visiting some of the fellowships because of many people today and employers reading the CVs, not in quantitative manner only, but in qualitative too. Quantitative means how many research papers, how many, what, in which level journals, how many, oh, what uh, impact factor uh, this specific journal has and all this. This is quantitative, um, you know, assessment of the CV. But qualitative is what about that person who is really using different types of skills, not really focused only on writing the research paper, but also uh, writing uh, teaching case studies, which speaks to the capacity of the person to be polyvalent, to be able to handle um, really uh, a very sophisticated uh, scholarship readership through the uh, academic papers, but also to handle executive education clients, for instance, uh, uh, students in the undergraduate and graduate programs. So this is a very challenging way to have a single person to be able to do in this and this at the same time. So it, it allows you to sell <laughs> your, your skills in a more convincing manner, and that benefits your career for sure. And of course, without saying that, uh, fulfillment. You feel very fulfilled when, and a, a sense of satisfaction that you get when you get your case published, and then you have that capacity to um, really use it in your classroom, and then have others use your, your case, it's really amazing. So it's really beyond anything. It's fulfilling 
it is a process of fun because you get to dig into the very challenging dilemmas that the company have and then you present it in a way that it is not so obvious to the student but at the same time is really intriguing to them and i would say that myself uh, with uh, my own experience in the case writing i am um, started to think about how can i enhance or diversify uh, the traditional case studies. We will see that there are so many different case studies and the writing of those case studies uh, will also differ. Uh, something that I, I, I had uh, is the um, a guest um, editorial uh, where I served as a, as a guest editor, where I had the idea to actually engage students and improve their understanding of the case content through some visual cartoons that will help the, the student to emphasize with the protagonist. So having some visual representations of those um, protagonists help the student to empathize and understand what they feel. Particularly in cross-cultural settings where, uh, for instance, students are based in America and they have to analyze a case of uh, of a company located in the Middle East with people, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, with understanding of their culture, or their specific uh, values, and uh, things like that. And one of the cases that I developed talks about family business and uh, that the family business of multi-generational, uh, so which uh, succeeded to change the generation and realms from one generation to another. And that is a case study that also won an award. And it is based uh, on a cartoon as I say, a uh, storybook case. And that as a student, for instance, who backed up my old development of the story through this cartoon, as you can see, um, from one, there were four different cartoons where you can see the life cycle of that corporation and how it evolved and how the reality of that company uh, changed uh, over time. And then where a person who is located in a, in a different country can really even understand their attire, how people dress, uh, what people do in that specific culture, uh, how uh, they, they behave through really visual representations which help to understand the dilemmas really and cultural specificities of that uh, specific environment. So you see, this is a cartoon um, based case study. Melissa mentioned the compact cases. Those are very short cases. And then the traditional cases, which typically can be 10 to 15 pages long, right? Uh, five, six, seven thousand words up till 10, even sometimes 12 thousand words. Right, if we go now to understand who the case study involved, Definitely, we can understand that we have many stakeholders, and those stakeholders are, and writers, of course, the instructors who are using that, students, protagonists of the case from whom you take the information, and, of course, the editors, because we would like to, um, to um, publish our case studies, for sure, and then reviewers who are going to review anonymously our case. Uh, definitely, the key question in all this, who are the key stakeholders? And you will guess that the key stakeholders are definitely the instructors and the students. And I would put first even more the students than the instructors and then the instructors. And keeping in mind that there are those two key stakeholders, from here we understand that there are two essentials of a case study, of a successful case studies, combining the perspective of the student and the instructor. Student sees or students see the case. They do read the case, and that's why in the whole development process, you're going to have a document, which is your teaching pedagogical case study on the one side. Yet, this is not enough for us to have a solid pedagogical case study. We need the perspective of the instructor. Why, do you, why did we develop the case? What do we want to emphasize with this case? What kind of concepts, frameworks, theories, perspectives we want to emphasize and make students understand through this case? So that's why we'll need something which is called either teaching note or instructor's manual, right? So either one or another, it's the same thing. Together, this will create, when we combine both of them, we will create a relevant and publishing, publishable sorry, teaching and um, or pedagogical case study. Right. If we were to say now, what is and what makes a star case study a good case study? What is important to know that definitely it is a pedagogical tool per se. So it's not a research and it's not an article. So it's very important to keep that in mind because how you're going to write it is going to be completely different from how you're going to write your research article. 
This already, the fact that it is a pedagogical tool drives the content of what you're going to write uh, and include within a teaching case study. Of course, there should be an engaging, a relevant story. There should be something that will help the reader put uh, the person who is reading into the shoes of the key protagonist. Definitely the case, that's why we want students to develop their thinking. The case should not provide uh, a, 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 like direction toward one single correct answer. There is no one single correct answer. There should be a deliberation with discussion about what might be several options and solutions to the dilemmas that the decision makers face. So the students then are going to be motivated to take and propose uh, to, to take or make a specific and relevant decision in the place of the protagonist. Now, what type of cases are preferred? And I put here both perspectives, student and instructor. And you will see that in majority of cases, if I were to make a more interactive webinar and select somebody from the audience who is a, a student and somebody else from their, uh, uh, the side of instructors, and if I were to ask the question, you will see the series of questions that will alternate here. You will see that in, in majority of cases, the student answer and the instructor answer will coincide. So if I were to ask the question to both of those stakeholders, which are the cases that are, or what type of cases that are preferred? Um, cases that are success stories or failures. In majority of cases, people will say, uh, both students and professors or instructors, that those are failures. They wanna see cases of failures to understand them how and failures it means problems not that the company failed that the company is about to face a very risky situation and if we don't change something we don't adopt the strategy we don't make a clever decision the company is about to uh, really go bankrupt and then lose all the investments and everything so the risk that is being involved there is attracting a lot of the attention so most students and professors are attracted by discussing problematic cases rather than showcase that was a success and this is how they achieved the success and all this, right? A second thing, which are the question, uh, cases that ask for action and decisions or cases that just narrate a story without any action? Of course, the cases that are requiring to take actions. Cases which are based on fieldwork or on publicly available information typically on the field work, because those are more intriguing and challenging, things that are no, not easily available to the students, which make the case more interesting. Cases which are written and uh, are based on the recent events, the events that students can recall, or past events which happened many, many decades ago. Typically, it's more favored the recent events with whom people can relate or associate with. Cases that report, on data or cases that narrate a story. Uh, narration cases are more interesting. Cases which are stories or histories. History is basically date and event, date and event. It's very dry, it's not interesting. The stories are more appealing for both students and faculty, uh, students and, and professors, which are long or short. Well, here maybe there is a little bit of a, of a discrepancy. Students will prefer short, Professors prefer a little bit longer. Why? Because they would like to have more questions to be answered and they have to make sure that the content of the case provides sufficient information for the students to be able to answer the questions of the case, right? Uh, which provides sufficient information or not, of course, sufficient information, which are identifiable um, cases where we can uh, write cases on identifiable companies or not, of course, identifiable, not invented. And that's why you'll see in our collection only the real case studies on real organizations are uh, allowed, not fictional case cases. On topics related to course material or not, of course, that's why it is a pedagogical tool, because we want to emphasize a specific theory or concept which describes or du duplicates informants a uh, quote uh, yes we would like the protagonist to speak up and that's why the case should be rich in quotes a quotation extracted from the interviews that we take from protagonists which are challenging pro provocative which present a problem yes of course we want that because that's how students are intrigued uh, about solving the issues that exist in the case now 
to give you a very practical hands-on aspect about what makes a teaching case a compelling case. There is something, a tool that I try to, 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 to create and where I label the tool as the six P's of compelling cases. What makes your case strong? The six P's. And those P's stand for, for six different um, levels and characteristics of a compelling case study. Uh, problems, um, plots, protagonists, paradigms, possibilities, and potential. So what does it mean? Problems. As I presented before and I told you, typically which cases are really attractive to students? The cases which really create a problem, a challenge, a dilemma, so that the student is presented with the problem and dilemma, and then at the end of the case, the dilemma is open-ended, and the students have to reflect on that and propose potential solutions. So it's very interesting when the case stimulates the debate. If there is a closure and then the solution presented, you know, so, so what? It's not interesting. So every single case should have a dilemma, a challenge. And that's the problem to which I actually allude in the first P of a compelling case study. Plots. Plots refers to those different pieces of information when you provide a context which is intriguing. It is a story. It's, happen, it's happening in an unusual place. It has a very rich context. It's an emerging market per se is already very attractive, but in a very rare industry where there are very unique stories happening um, and then something that uh, just uh, a new innovation that happened and then where the company is trying to, for instance, sell that innovative product in other markets. So it's really intriguing stories and contexts and situations that try to contextualize uh, the, the, the problem that uh, the, um, the protagonists are facing. So that's plots and making your case very compelling and interesting. Protagonists, uh, that is the other P to which we refer. Protagonists is that you should feel when you write the case and when you read it later on that there is a there are people there are real people there going through this dilemma suffering in that case and having a real challenge how to save the corporation so the voice of the protagonist has to be heard and has to appear throughout the case. And that's why before I said, you have to be able to really use different quotes uh, extracted from the interviews uh, that you had with the key protagonists of the case. Paradigms, remember that your case is related to a course. It's not that you took it from nowhere and then you are just having that case study to have fun in the class. No, 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 no. You are still in a university, in a educational institution, and you are using the case to reinforce a specific theory, model, uh, a specific problem that you want to emphasize in the class. And that's why you are using this as a real tool to help students to use a specific model, a theory, a theoretical perspective, a framework, a matrix, right? Through that specific case. So paradigm alludes to these models, uh, theories uh, that you would like to emphasize or reinforce through the case study that you use uh, in the classroom and that you develop. And then possibilities, very important. And sometimes the case writers do make that mistake. The case ends up in a way that it alludes to only one key solution so that uh, the students kind of are not incited and motivated to deliberate and to discuss and all these to interact together because they feel that there is only one possibility. No, a successful case, right, a case is written in a way that it offers possibilities to debate where students can come up with several possible solutions. So there are open-ended opportunities for students to identify several solutions and then deliberate on which would be the first one, one more solid solution to go and to implement. And then the last P, if you see it in the middle, it's typically um, a P which is more relevant for uh, the editors, for associate editors, when they receive a case and they look through the case, they see that maybe the other P's are not very developed, but the case in itself presents a lot of potential. It is up to the editorial team to provide with the help of reviewers, a very constructive feedback to the authors so that potential case uh, will develop the other previous piece 
in order to um, rewrite, reconceptualize the case in a way that it becomes compelling and it taps successfully in the other uh, five Ps that I just presented. So the potential is really the P that is up to the editorial team of the journal to which you are going to submit. So what about the case structure when we're writing the case? What is essential in that? First of all, remember the P of the problem and definitely you should start from that critical issue and decision point and then continue with all the relevant information that will help the students to address the decision or critical issue and point through uh, the description of the case, through the different charts and tables that you're going to put to reinforce um, the, 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 the dilemma and then to help students to use this information to address the dilemma and any visual representations like the cartoons that I presented before. It can be a cartoon case study that uh, reinforces the understanding of students of what the different protagonists are facing. And then you will conclude, it's like you see that um, circularity, you, you start from the focus, you present the information and you end with the focus again because by, by the end of the case the reader might forget what the, what the problem is. So you conclude and you close the loop by referring back to the uh, problem that you started with uh, the case. So what is the typical structure of the case? Of course the content will differ but the structure is more or less common. You see as many cases as you write, you'll see that they have this common structure, an identifiable structure, which will then allude to those different P's that I mentioned before. First of all, the case opening, and definitely case opening, is going to be alluding to the P of problems, right? The dilemma, the challenge that you want students right away, right away to be hooked to and at attracted to. So that's the case opening. Now, the core of the case of the case, the whole information that you're going to provide for the students to be able to use, this, uh, use it in order to be able to substantiate their analysis. Typically, which P's that core of the case will allude to? Definitely the P of, of plots, the intriguing things that you have, the P's of protagonists, right? That is very important. Uh, the P of possibilities, you have to write in a way that you don't present the case that will allude to only one single possible solution. No, it should be open-ended so that students can come up with many different possible solutions to the case, right? And then definitely we will see that the potential that the case will have uh, will be seen through the review process when the associate editor and the editor-in-chief and the reviewers will see the potential that the case will have. Now, in this piece, we will see and the background of the company and the information about the industry and the context of the case and the decision maker and other relevant information through the charts and appendices that you can represent in order to then conclude and close the loop with the other P, which alludes again to the problem that you started your case in the first place. Now, my question here is, which of the P's I didn't mention, and it's not typically appearing clearly in your uh, case, teaching case. You will guess that this is the paradigm. The theoretical paradigm or the theory that you want to reinforce will not be clearly appearing or mentioned in the case, because this is something that you will discuss about in the pedagogical tool of the teaching note, right? And that's the one which is going to support and help the instructor to use this case in their classroom. Now, on the um, website, you can see, so I'm gonna go through that. I just wanted to project because all these uh, in this slide here, you can take this from the website and the online resources that Melissa mentioned, uh, because there you can clearly see how the editors are making decisions about the case studies, case uh, studies about their relevance, about their potential to really bring into the classroom uh, this important um, um, challenge that students will analyze and then make specific uh, or propose specific solution to those challenges, right? So you can see how many criteria uh, we go through in order to see whether the case has a solid story. So 
we do not forbid, forget that this is educational resource and we have to present a story in a way that it's not too obvious, it is challenging, it is presenting a balanced perspective. You don't take, as, a, as an author, you don't take sides, you don't um, really write in a way that you say that this is bad and this is good. It is up to students to decide. So you have to embrace a very neutral stance when you present your characters, your protagonists, the problems there. It's up to you to see uh, as a student, as a reader, to see what is the problem and to analyze that problem. So uh, the good case study also brings that voice of protagonist and the editor looks at this P of protagonist to see whether it is a real case and it is represented through the voices of their protagonists. Now, we're getting to the second document, Teaching Not. The TN stands for that. Who is the key actually stakeholder when you write the teaching note? Well, the key stakeholder is the instructor. And the instructor basically is thinking about the questions of what you include in the teaching note. What are the different sections? Um, is the teaching note derived from the case study? Is it really a viable support of the case study? If you were to use somebody else teaching note uh, case, what you would like to have in the teaching note, which will convince you to use that case study successfully in your class in the classroom. Um, think about this, take this perspective, and then you will, as a writer of the case, be able to understand what to put in the teaching note to support or help other instructors to use your own case. Now, typically, a very good teaching note. Uh, would include the following sections. Uh, you're going to have a case syn synopsis. You're going to talk in the next section about the target audience. So for whom this case was developed, what course, what level, undergraduate, graduate, uh, executive in the education audience, specific customer, like a company for whom you developed this case, learning objectives, very interesting and many uh, more recently case writers do forget and that's why we as editors remind that there should be a section about methods of data collection and how did uh, you analyze the data because we accept only factual cases based on real events and not fictional cases not invented cases and then a detailed teaching plan with teaching boards uh, then a section on models and theories that you want to reinforce through the case. Then suggested reading for case preparation and usage in the case in the in the classroom. And then list of discussion questions. That is very important, right? How, what questions you're going to ask to students. Then sample answers to each of those questions that you propose. And then even more interesting, the epilogue because there's gonna be a time lag that will happen between when you gather the data and you wrote the case and you publish the case so that uh, many times when the case is very interesting, students in the classroom, they ask, okay, we analyzed the case and we proposed this, but professor, do you know what really happened? Reality, what, what decision the managers took and what happened? What, are they doing okay, not? Did they fail or did they succeed with their, with their solution? So students adore to compare their solution they propose with the reality of what the manager decided to do and where, uh, where those decisions that the managers took successful or not. Right. So this is the, typically that you write in the epilogue, and it's very interesting. And um, the very good hint when you write the case study is basically uh, the teaching case, uh, the, the notes uh, for the teaching case, is to think about whether when you, you, you have the material on the teaching note, would you, if you were to be a person who didn't write the case, would you be able, using that teaching note, uh, to adopt that, that case in your classroom? with the help of this teaching note. If you would be able to, it means that the teaching note is very comprehensive. If not, it means that you need to add all that information to be able to write a very solid uh, teaching note to motivate other instructors to use your case in their own classes, right? Uh, again, there are editorial criteria for a good teaching note. And as I said, the, the previous uh, sections here already tell you how successful your teaching note is, what you need to include, because missing all those sections, definitely your case is going to be returned and the editors are going to say, you need to include that, you need to talk about that, you need to be clear about those different aspects. And many of the questions uh, that editors will look at and will address when they'll evaluate your case, it's going to be, is the audience identified? Is it clear what type of learning objectives you have there? 
Do you have a clear teaching plan? Do you have a very detailed sample answer to each of the questions there? Do you have really a description about what kind of assignments you're going to give to your students in the classroom? Um, is it uh, that you develop very clearly um, the um, uh, procedure when that case should be used after which chapter related to which content, to which type of module in their specific a course. So this is a very valuable guide that you give to your uh, uh, potential instructors who are going to use your case. Um, constantly we see as editors that uh, writers do not develop very solid learning objectives which are aligned with the audience. Sometimes they have very basic learning objectives but their audience is a graduate audience. Students in the masters in executive education level uh, which re requires a more sophisticated type of learning objective. So that's why uh, I and we typically uh, refer the authors to go to the uh, taxonomy of learning objectives developed by Bloom and where you can see the more advanced the audience is, the more sophisticated your learning objectives have, been, have to be. And then here you see the variety of different uh, verbs that you can use in order to develop more sophisticated learning objectives like create, reflect, design. Those are type of um, uh, learning objectives that are appropriate for high level audience, for the audience which is in a executive education, as opposed to undergrad, uh, very startup students who are just starting their education, right? So the objectives which start with verbs like to list, to summarize, to recognize, it's appropriate only for the low level undergraduate students and audience, right? Not for executive or master students where they have to come up with more sophisticated learning outcomes out of that. So Bloom taxonomy is very relevant in order to be able to challenge student, uh, students in achieving those more sophisticated learning objectives. Common mistakes that we do see. Uh, well, typical thing that uh, a case study is written like a research paper with citations, quotes of articles and references. No, no, no. This is not a research paper. This is a teaching material. So it's a different style that needs to be used. The teaching note, the common mistake we see, the teaching note is underdeveloped. Typically a good teaching note is double the size of their case study because it's really guiding the, the instructor through all the different steps uh, uh, in, in the usage of this. Another common mistake that there are no sample answers provided to the different types of um, uh, questions that are developed. Um, many situations we see that there is a mismatch. There are questions asked, but the, the, the case does not provide sufficient information to be able to answer those questions, right? So there is a mismatch. Uh, learning objectives are not appropriate to the level of the audience. They are too basic for the master level or they are too challenging for the undergraduate level. And then uh, another thing that we always recommend, please pretest your case before submitting it for publication. See what reaction students uh, get to your case and then how would you stimulate your students to actually then um, to, to, to interact in class, what kind of reaction they had, what kind of comment, revise that and then submit it for potential publication. Aspects to consider, and here I'm going to give you some advice in how to write a, a good case and a teaching note. What aspects do you need to consider? And I am uh, watching the time, I am aware I'll take five more minutes because the remaining 15 minutes we can have Q and A's uh, to see what kind of questions you have and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So what kind of aspects in terms of writing you can consider? And by the way, uh, we are trying to, to do the webinar to really motivate you in starting to do that. But if there is interest, we can do so many other webinars because it is it's very difficult to pack everything in one hour, right? And to be able to share all the, uh, the key success factors in a successful case writing, um, teaching note writing, and in successful case publication. So those are really three key sophisticated processes that will be definitely um, very, very um, you know, responsive to your needs if you need more detailed, uh, really, uh, webinars for each of those aspects. So. Definitely a case study is using a professional language. Uh, we do have quotes from protagonists which make it a little bit more realistic, but then we still keep it 
a narrative style, like a story that we develop in still a professional language, not a casual jargon based language, no. Another thing, definitely there should be a structure. It's not like 10 pages without headings, subheadings, no. Your case should be broken down in section, subsection, exactly like you would have that in a research paper, the same here, right? To, to help students see that there is a logic behind each of that section. Flow of ideas, that overall or organization of the case, there should be a continuity of the story going from one part to another. So it's very interesting to help and guide your reader through those different types of sections. Consistency of ideas, so content-wise, it's not that in one part of the case you say one thing, and the other you say the opposite thing. No, you can highlight the contradictions, but if that contradiction comes from the point of view of different protagonists, so there the, the clashes can be, uh, can be uh, through facing through the way how you do write the case. Uh, quality of the language, of course, nobody uh, counseled the, the importance of having uh, grammatical, uh, grammatically correct sentences, right? The length of the sentences shouldn't be 10, 10 pages long. It should be uh, two, three, uh, let's say, uh, lines maximum, but the length of the sentence, the grammar, no mistakes, uh, properly copy edited is very important. And of course, I would not stop reiterating the importance of all visuals that you can provide to support uh, your case studies. Charts, tables, uh, graphs, uh, all those things are really important in order to be able to provide sufficient information for the students to be able to, to write a compelling case. Now, in the publication process, I'm happy Melissa revised the majority of aspects related to the publication process, but I would like you to just be aware that you as a as an author, you will submit the case and the case will go through the hands of several people in the journal. First, editorial assistant, who will then assign that to the editor-in-chief. The editor-in-chief will assign to associate editor. The associate editor will uh, nominate some anonymous reviewers and then then with the reports of those anonymous reviewers, the decision is going to be received. And Melissa revised very well the process of how the publication process happens, and I will not go through that any longer, but I would like you as authors not to be demotivated by the fact that sometimes the publication is a lengthy process. And why is that the case? And here I just uh, showed you some of the aspects uh, of the challenging process of publication uh, that we all witness and face as authors, as editors. Um, who are the people who are review, re revising, uh, sorry, reviewing the, the case? Those are people like us, other case writers, who are also busy and who are committing sometimes but do not stick to the deadline. So it is up to us in the editorial team to nudge them uh, nicely and to push them, to ask them to really uh, commit and to uh, keep by the deadline. Sometimes the uh, reviewers commit but then the uh, deadline uh, passes and they still didn't submit. So we resend the, uh, again the, the reminders uh, and then they, 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 they ask for extension of the deadline or basically they are not reachable and we have to invite others. So this is sometimes a lengthy pr process, but remember it's the law of reciprocity. I submit the case and the author and some of you might revise my case. Later on you submit your case and me as a, as a service, quality service that I have to give back to the community of, of authors, I will review that case, right? So it's important to, to do this collegial process and commit to that service, right? It's very important. Now, in the submission, very important, you will see that in all those type of, um, of uh, resources that Melissa went through, you will see that there are compulsory files that you need to submit to, uh, to the journal which is the case study, the teaching note, and then you have title page and uh, Emerald Emerging Markets Collection provides you a template and consent to publish from the protagonists from whom you collected the data uh, that they agree that their case uh, be published. And then optional files like maybe third party copyright permissions if you did use some copyright material uh, or tables, figures and images. So here for instance I show you, you'll find that online the, the template for the title page, right? You'll find that online in those resources that Melissa mentioned. Then consent to publish 
the same thing you find in those online resources. So you have to have this submitted also with your case study and the teaching notes. Now, for the submission tips and advice, and I'm going to stop here uh, to conclude uh, and to encourage you really, really, really to uh, write your, your, your case studies and submit them for publication. First of all, make sure you, che you check the journal submission requirements on the website, all those resources that Melissa mentioned and me too. Second, really follow the submission requirements to the letter because those are the checklists that you have really to comply with. So this is very important. Pay attention to the formatting. So many times we do receive very messy submissions in different formats and different layouts and things like that. It already predisposes re reviewers badly. If you are not having a consistent uh, formatting and style which is professional and which is neat and clear. Um, quality of the language. When we receive a case where there are grammar mistakes, it's uh, puts up uh, the, the reviewers off. They, they just refuse and they say, first of all, make sure that the case is copy edited and then advise the reviewers. It's very important. Attention to detail, organize your files properly, submit them under the different headings. It's very important because there are several of those documents and we need to be able to find where we put what. Of course, do not forget to anonymize your submission. Sometimes we see the author submit the case and then somewhere in their teaching note they say, uh, this uh, teaching note was, was developed by this and they put their name. It is an anonymous process, so please do not put anywhere but in your title page your name because the title page is not really then sent to reviewers. And then what is very important is ask for feedback from, from peers before submitting the case. Make somebody else to, particularly a very, um, um, let's say, experienced case writer, to read your case and give you an advice before submitting your case to publication. You'll see that your chances of success will increase uh, 10 times. So I hope this webinar was useful, encouraging, and I really hope that we will receive many, many of your cases at our collection. I wish you the best of luck with writing and publishing your case studies. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, uh, Andre can moderate that, address them to me, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Over Thank to you, you Andre. Virginia. It was brilliant. Uh, we do have many comments uh, praising your session. And thank you very much. Uh, it was a passionate, I think many colleagues said it was a passionate uh, session. Can I invite uh, Melissa to, to come back? Uh, we do have two questions here. Uh, actually, well, two questions from the same person. Um, they are asking uh, if Emerald, well, we are interested in emerging markets in general, but they, they are asking for a piece of advice from Melissa. And the second part of this question is if uh, Professor Virginia could give us a tip on how to be more successful on publishing teaching cases, please. So the question was, do we accept um, cases outside of the emerging markets? Sorry, could you repeat that? Um, fr from Latin America, if we would be interested in publishing cases from this region. Oh, absolutely. Um, yes, we have um, the submission platform for EMCS linked in my presentation. We would certainly love to see your submissions from Latin America. Um, we also have a number of competitions, um, one of which is for Latin America as well. Um, the deadlines have passed for this year, but there's always next year as well. Um, and if you have you know, specific questions about the case that you are considering writing or potentially already in the process of, please do feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I'd be more than happy to have a conversation about your work um, and how we can get it published in one of our collections. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so so just, just before passing it on to, to Professor Virginia, some, some people are asking about how to get access. So I put this um, slide here. So if you want to get access to our cases, please get in touch with Sergio or Isabella or Matilde. Their emails are at the bottom. And if you want to get in touch with Professor Virginia or Melissa, their emails are at the top. So Virginia, would you give us any tip on how to be more successful, sorry, on how to get published? 
definitely. And if you can, by the way, I guess that this question will come. Um, if you please share uh, again, uh, enable me to share the screen. I have one slide on this, so I can be visual again. You understood that I'm very visual with my cartoon case studies and things. So I do have it here. So maybe for participants uh, to see, I do have some final piece of advice that I was thinking about sharing if I have time and that's good. Thank you for that question, which allows me to actually share this final piece of advice uh, about successful case, case writing. So uh, beyond what is here, and you'll see the first one, is um, really when you write the case, uh, very important is not to bore the readership. And it's we are reading as the associate editors, the editor-in-chief, the reviewers. If there is this narration, narrative style, engaging, you, you, you really like if you were to read a drama that is happening in the organization, just that it's organization, not a family life or something like that, even though it can be a family case study, right, of a family business, right? So engaging writing style, not to bore the reader. And this is also the success in the classroom. Students, if they read your case till the end, that's already telling how amazing of a writer of a case study you are. One, two, I would say, it's the topic. Remember when I said potential? Sometimes reviewers can be a little bit harsh, but that's good because they give you constructive feedback. But it is the role of an editor, associate editor, to look at the feedback received and see if there is potential. So if you really use a, a topic which is uh, attractive, is unique, is rare, and the question that was asked, would we welcome cases from Latin America? Of course, particularly, look, many times when I teach uh, having some, some relationships with some people uh, uh, from Latin America, I do bring many stories, particularly in Brazil, and I say, look, Carnaval, many people here, they've never been in Brazil, they've never heard about, they don't know the, the cultural aspect, they don't know the importance of Carnaval once per year happening and all this. So for them, that would be so interesting, particularly if the company from here would like to export here and there. So we are we are really craving to receive uh, more and more cases from uh, Latin America. So that would be very topical cases of things that are happening right now, the way how the, the dilemmas are being handled there. So the subject of your uh, topic has to be catchy and it has to be really attracting the attention of the student because it's something from, from today happening, relevant, and not something that is uh, forgotten old. Remember that the most attractive cases and successful in that, uh, if you select a problem, a decision-driven case study, not something that you read and okay, so what, and it's finished, no problem-based decision-based case study where we are going to induce those readership, meaning the students, to make decisions. Another piece of advice, pretest your case, because many times I've seen, I thought when I wrote the case that that's the way how I'm going to use it in the classroom before submitting for publication. I test it in the classroom, you know, a hint to see students, do they like at all my case? Uh, what they don't like, what they didn't understand. And even when you write your teaching note, students sometimes, and this is a hint, students can help you to write your teaching note. Remember that I said in the teaching note you have a list of sample questions, and then it's a must to provide a sample uh, answer to each of those questions. You can give an assignment to your students, ask those sample questions, make them answer uh, those sample questions, and then you can use that as an example right of a simple answer to your question plus you would see eventually some things that you didn't even consider because students are smart and they come up with sometimes things that you didn't even consider you can then address this in your teaching notes right so that's very important keep a connection between the case and the teaching note remember the detachment sometimes there is not enough information in the case and then you ask a question in the teaching note that's not relevant go back between the notes and the case to make sure that they are connected another thing focus on the teaching note remember to develop a major reason of us sending back the case is when the teaching note is underdeveloped it doesn't provide all the headings and subheadings and the information and the uh, objectives and everything that is needed there uh, to uh, the potential instructors who will use the case. Um, strive to improve, that's a piece of advice. T 
take the webinars, case writing workshops. Um, we do have more and more with Emerald developing those workshops where sometimes we have uh, uh, guest editorials and there are um, authors who submit their cases and go through the workshops to improve and then finally submit for these specific um, um, uh, special issues on a specific topic. It might be, for instance, special issues uh, on Brazil companies, only from Brazil, from different industry, but from Brazil. Many, another thing that is not here, but it's also a piece of advice, for the first, second, third case, why don't you co-write a case with an experienced case writer? You will learn a lot. Another thing, my advice, network. Uh, your students are golden mines in the classroom because you can, through them, get your protagonists and cases, uh, stories, which are so interesting. And my, of many of my award-winning cases, actually, I got the access to the field to the CEOs of the company, how big they are, how important they are, imagine how busy they are. And I got the access to interview them, to get the data, to have their, their quotes in the case through the students, right? So I made the students call source because together we gathered the data, I taught them how to do that, how to, and of course I jumped in to, to polish the case, to write the case in many cases, but already getting the access to the field is amazing through the students. So remember to network and definitely striving to improve. You will see how over time, more you do, more you learn, better you become. Good luck. Brilliant, Virginia. Thank you very much. Um, we are running out of time. So um, I want to, to, not sure if Valeria is still there. Valeria, if you're still there and you want to, to show up, please do so. Uh, yeah, in the meantime, thank you. Yeah, so I want to to give you uh, those final minutes, maybe also to to Melissa and and then to Virginia. Obviously, if you want to share your your final words, please. I'm going first. Um, sure, I'll go first. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you all today. Um, about publishing in EMCS. Virginia, your presentation was phenomenal. Um, it was great to hear you speak, really engaging. Um, and my final note would just be to say that my inbox is always open. If you have questions or comments, um, we're a really committed team at EMCS, I think it's fair to say, and very engaged as well. Um, so we look forward to potentially working with you as authors, and we hope to see your submissions in the future. So go next. <laughs> I'll go next. Uh, thank you. As, uh, as I said, I adore to work with a very dynamic uh, team at Emerald. So we are here from different parts of the world and we are together. So all those people who were there, thank you very much. Uh, that indeed who stood till the end. Uh, it's difficult to make an engaging webinar interactive because it's a webinar and it's uh, just one person led at, at a time. But I hope it was really beneficial and really my purpose was here to be realistic and at the same time to have a balanced perspective of an author, of a scholar, of a instructor, of a case writer, so that I can show you from different perspective that whether you are a scholar, an educator, a professor, a just a PhD student, writing case studies is a fun experience, but an experience which helps you to develop a lot of skills that is going to be beneficial definitely in your academic career as a teacher, as a scholar, as a researcher. So we are looking forward to receive your cases. Please do participate in different improvement uh, type of events like webinars, workshops, Please, there are conferences even um, by North American uh, Case Association where you submit your cases. There is another conference happening, uh, I think, next year in United Arab Emirates on only teaching case studies. So it's another venue how you can improve or polish your case before submitting the case for publication. So please do get involved in that. We have a lot of competition which speaks uh, to the quality of your cases with the rewards and awards. So this is very uh, also motivating for you to develop your skills and never stop striving to and trying to improve and get better. Good luck with that. Valeria? Uh, thank you. So uh, I would say that this was very inspiring. 
Uh, excellent session. Uh, I love the energy, enthusiasm, and the love and passion. This is really, uh, you can see it, and I think makes people really reflecting. Uh, also, um, because we saw so much how to write and how to use in class, and uh, also about the competitions. I think we had a lot. And these sessions for me, it's really a, a way to reflect because sometimes you have an idea and you don't know how to start. And this is really a, an opportunity, I think, for all to, to take this time and really see what we can do about and how can we improve. So this was excellent. I'd like to thank uh, Melissa, Professor Virginia and Andre for this wonderful session. And again, I hope this inspired everybody and we start to work uh, harder and because uh, students and professors, all of us need some good cases. So thank you very much and a wonderful day for everybody. And thank you everybody for participating also. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye, all the best. Thanks, bye. Bye.